can lose. That's why everything is really a case by case basis. And that's why it's really you sitting down with a counselor with your income and expenses and your particular circumstances that's really going to come up with, well, what are our best options? And remember, sometimes we're working on two options at a time. I'm not a person who likes to put all my eggs in one basket. Um, and so sometimes we're working on a modification, but we might be working on a refinance at the same time. And another thing to remember about modifications, I'm kind of glad this brings me back to uh, a case in point. A lot of times when banks are modifying these loans where they're lowering your interest rate, they're only doing it for a set period of time. A lot of banks are doing it, I'm going to say on average, for five years. So they might say, okay, we're going to modify your rate. We're taking out of 11%, we're going to put you in five to three quarters, and we're going to do it for a five-year period of time. And what I'm telling people is, if we can't get the bank to modify you for 30 years, and the good thing is, more and more banks are beginning to modify 30 years. But I'm going to say still the majority are, are, are trying to do five-year modifications. What I'm telling people is it's very important that you keep contact with us. And that's why I take advantage of some of the other classes we have, the money empowerment class about you know budgeting and improving the credit score. Because what I'm telling my client is, OK, if we got you a five-year modification and it's a good interest rate and you're going to be able to kind of make your payments again, make your payments on time for a year, come back. Let's see if we can get you permanently into one of these great refinance products that are out there. Because once you've been paying on time for a year, uh, sometimes when people are turned down for a refinance, if they get to the point where they're paying on time, if we can get your mortgage modified between that lower interest rate and it's more affordable for you, then at the end of that year period, then a lot of times we can get you refinanced. So it's really important <laughs> to keep the relationship. Don't get your modification, especially if it's not a 30-year modification, and just you know wait. Because you know, it's funny how quickly years go by. And you can say, I have a five-year, and then well, I'll come back. And then the next thing you know, you're four and a half years into it. So that's why I'm really trying to tell people, if it's, if it's a modification, if it's not for 30 years, then make those payments on time for a year and, and get back so that we can see if we can do a refund. Is 30 okay. years the cap? Um, well, no. Um, the question is, does you be dependent upon the lender in terms of what they do? Because they can modify and extend the term of the loan. Okay? Yes, it's possible still to modify. Remember, a modification, any kind of adjustment of the original term. So if somebody had a high fixed rate, mm -hmm. we'd still try and see if we could get it modified into a lower okay. fixed rate. Okay? Um, now I'm going to move on. I'm going to look at, there's a little PowerPoint in here, and I'm, I'm really not going to go through the PowerPoint bullet by bullet. But what I really wanted to cover is the fact that Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae. How many people are familiar with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae? Because they've been in the news a lot. Okay, <laughs> okay. So Freddie Mac had done a survey that really said 57% of, you know, of, of average borrowers out there were just totally unaware of their options. So that's one of the reasons why we really wanted to have a tremendous outreach effort to at least tell people, come in, investigate your options. The worst thing you can do is simply to do nothing. And another thing that, that probably has changed and that's really good is a, a lot of times when I used to do foreclosure intervention clinics, say, just three, four months ago before we really got the relationship going with Connecticut Fair Housing, if at the end of the clinic I had a client come up to me and say, you know what, I have a sale date next week. Um, and I'm thinking, well, okay, that doesn't give us any time to really work with you. Basically, I was just referring that person out for, for some sort of legal help. Um, because Connecticut Fair Housing has been coming in and meeting with our clients, then it's like, okay, this is what you need to do. You know, you need to get down to the court. You need to get on a short calendar for Monday morning. You need to ask for an extension of time or to open a judgment, and this is how you do it. And she would walk the person through, this is what you need to do. And the reason why I'm mentioning this, and to me, this is something that is truly really good and beneficial, and especially, I, I can speak for the judicial 
um, for the court system in New Haven because more of our clients uh, go to that particular court. Mm -hmm. But the judge uh, who sits uh, for housing foreclosure is more empathetic towards the borrower um, this day and age. And that has really changed from how it used to be. And what that means is, um, I'm going to say, and this is, this is not an exaggeration, that 99.9% .9 of our clients that we send before the judge to ask for an extension of time for whatever they're working on, whether it's a short sale, whether it's more time to get a modification, whether it's time to work on a refinance, they're being granted their extension of time. And what I depend on very heavily from our legal assistance is to coach and prepare our people so that when they go before the judge, they don't go round Robin's barn trying to describe you know, what happened, but basically are, are really succinct and clear. This is what we're doing. This is who we're working with. We're trying to get this modification. This is what we need, Your Honor. And they've been granting that. And what we do uh, to try and participate with that too is we will prepare letters um, for people to, to take to court with them, just talking about the fact that we're a nonprofit, HUD approved counseling agency, this person is working with us, and this is what we're trying to do with the lender. And to me, that's a very good thing. That's a very positive thing for you to know. Um, I think another thing that it's important for everybody to know is that this problem crosses all socioeconomic levels, all ethnicities. I see all sorts of loans. I'm going to say the majority of the loans that we see are adjustable rate. Um, a lot are from refinance, but you know, a lot are first purchasers who got into a job. have is because of our economic crisis, you know, there are a lot of people who have lost their jobs or companies have downsized. So whether or not they have a great mortgage or not, they still need mortgage assistance. Um, in terms of how we work with you and the lender, what we do, part of that paperwork that you handed in to us, remember there was an authorization, um, and that authorization is faxed in so that we can work with your lender on your behalf with you. Um, I think half the battle is getting to work with the right individuals. I think what you find, you get a lot of phone calls from what I call the collector. The collector, you're in a dialer system, they're gonna call every so often. The collector always offers up just one option. And usually this is an option that, I mean, I can maybe only think of one client that we ever negotiated this option with, and that's the repayment option. That's what the collector always wants you to do. I wanna put you in a repayment plan. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of repayment plans fail, and they fail simply because they make no sense. Because if I have a $1,500 mortgage and I'm struggling making a payment, and then you tell me, I will put you in a repayment plan, Bridget, where now you pay $2,250 for the next 10 months, you tell me what is the likelihood that I'm going to be able to do it. I know what they do. I'll leave off. Okay. And here's what happens with people. A lot of times, especially this was happening months ago when people really didn't know there were any agencies that they could go to, um, you're desperate. They're, they're saying, this is it. This is all or nothing. I really want to keep my house. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but then I, I commit to it, right? I sign on the dotted line, and that, that has happened to a lot of people. That's why I, I don't break it. And so, you know, I, I've had a lot of people who come to us who are in those repayment plans, and then we're trying to get them mm -hmm. into modifications. But all this to say is a collector normally is not going <coughs> to offer up a modification. Number one, a lot of them don't know about modifications because you got to remember, these banks, they have so many different arms and it's like they don't talk to each other. So it's like you have to get to the right department. The department that we work with is loan retention, loss mitigation, you know, different lenders have different names for it, but that's or the workout department. And that's a workout department is where they're gonna work out something like a modification, not a collection. I think that's very important for you to know. So you've handed in your paperwork. As I said, we send in the authorization. So who we're working with are, is someone from loan retention, workout department, loss mitigation. We're submitting your financials. We're submitting updated pay stubs. The reason why we ask you for a lot of information is different lenders want different things. Some of them want your tax returns. Some of them say, okay, as long as we give them the budget and the updated financials, 
um, and you know your pay stubs, that's enough. The hardship letter. How many people wrote your hardship letters? Okay. Do you, a hardship letter is not superfluous. Sometimes people say, well, why do I have to write a letter, you know, describing what happened? Let me tell you, wants a hardship letter. They want to see what brought you here in the first place. What are the things they're looking for? They're looking for some sort of significant decrease in income. That could have happened from a divorce. That could have happened from a loss of job. Um, or they want to see, and sometimes it's a com combination of the two, a significant increase in expenses. Now, of course, to say I went to Raymore and Flanagan's and bought $20,000 worth of furniture and this is my significant increase, that doesn't mean anything good or positive to the lender. But it could be, you know, there were medical uh, bills that, that caused a significant increase in my expenses. So that's why, that's why we ask you for it because the lender is going to ask us for a hardship letter. Um, and then in reference to um, how we work with the lender, the thing I want you to understand is that it's not an overnight process. I said that to you months before, um, that it's taking on average 60 to 90 days. Some lenders are a little faster, some lenders are slower. It really depends on how streamlined their process is, how many extra people that they've hired to kind of meet the demand that these lenders are faced with at this particular point in time. That, um, <coughs> any of the lenders are not willing to renegotiate or work out modifications. Mm -hmm. The answer is, unfortunately, yes. But the good part about the answer is it's fewer and further in between. I mean, even lenders that told me months ago they wouldn't modify now are modifying. Okay, so, but I, I just, this is once again where I always want to tell people this is a case by case kind of basis. So, remember once again, just thinking about how we work with the lender, what's very important to us is to have the authorization so that we can work with the lender and to really to have your income and expense analysis. And that's what, when you do your one on one, your counsel is going to go back through line by line the uh, budget that you handed in to us because sometimes we find that you accidentally made some errors or you omitted something. So we, we want to be as realistic as possible when we send it into the lender. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to tell you with Neighborhood Housing Services is we do have a small rescue fund. And sometimes I don't even like to say this because then the counselors get called and she told us about a rescue fund. <laughs> but let me tell you how this works. Let me practice it. And when I say small, a lot of it has been used so far. If this is, this is something truly very important. When you're working, um, trying to find a solution with your lender, some people might be at a point where the lender is no longer accepting payments. If the lender is no longer accepting payments, what should you be doing each month with your monthly mortgage payments? Saving. Saving, okay? This is what we get so often from people. Oh, wow. Well, while that time period, we thought we'd just pay other bills. And see, what happens is, remember I told you it might take three months to negotiate, three or four months to negotiate, um, even if, say you were in an 11% mortgage and say your payment was $2,300 and you said, Bridget, I really can't afford $2,300, but if we're trying to get you down to a 6% interest rate and then those payments would put you at, say, $1,700, I always tell a person, you should be at least setting aside that, the, the difference. that, that, that difference, mm -hmm. that, that $1,700, because at the end of the day, when the lender comes back, a lot of times and they say, okay, we're going to do a modification, what they're going to want is consideration or a down payment. Mm -hmm. Same thing. You know, sometimes they call it consideration or call it a down payment. So if I have a client, for instance, um, who I'm working with, and maybe the reason why they got behind is because his wife lost his job, but now his wife has gotten his job back but maybe it's still taking us four months to negotiate this, then you still should be setting aside something during those four months so that when the modification comes through and they say, okay, we want a $4,000 down payment to go with this modification. 
And once they decide they're going to modify your loan, here's the funny thing about the lenders. They might take their time getting you the modification, but once you get the modification, let me tell you what they do. They send it to you, Federal Express, DHL, whatever. And then they say, 48 hours, we want this back to us. And they'll send you, you know, a, a DHL or Federal Express thing to send it back. But they'll they'll take forever. But when they when it comes, they want it back in 48 hours. So that's why I'm telling a person, set aside your money, be prepared. They're going to want a cashier's check. So how does my rescue fund work? Well, if I have a successful modification, and maybe I have someone and they have a consideration of $3,000, what I'll do is I'll match them with the difference uh, to get a successful modification. So um, that's something that I'm kind of throwing out there. I'm hoping to get more money in it, but that's how I've used my rescue funds. When we've been able to get something successful, worked out with the lender, but I want my client to come most of the way, and then, you know, if, if, if they need some help, we can help them there. Yes, sir. What is the basis when a bank do not accept? This is what it is. You can be one month behind and, and still mail your payment and they're going to accept. You can be two months behind, same thing. Three months behind, same thing. A lot of lenders, once you reach that 120-day mark of four months, then that's when they might return a payment and say, we want the whole thing. So it's when you get to that point where Sometimes they'll send what's called a demand letter, which basically says, this is what you owe, you have a 30-day period to get this to us. And then if you're sending payments, you'll find they're sending the payments back. So I'm going to say a good rule of thumb is normally when you're getting beyond the 90-day to that 120-day, that that's when the lender will sometimes start um, no longer accepting your payments. Okay? Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about after the rescue funds, um, after this little PowerPoint, this is where it has the little back sheet on the Hope for Homeowners. That was the refi product I was telling you about. And then after that, there's a fact sheet on the mortgage crisis job training program. Um, and then after that, there's a little fact sheet on EMAP. And that was on the very first page when I told you the State Mortgage Assistance Program. Um, that I have is the Emergency Mortgage Assistance Program, and that's Connecticut State Assistance Program. It hasn't been used since 1992. It hasn't been funded since 1992. Um, it's very important to understand this, because a lot of times when people call us, they say, I want to apply for the Emergency Mortgage Assistance Program. And the reason why I have people come to the clinic is because I want them to understand, first of all, what the guidelines to make you eligible. But most importantly, the Emergency Mortgage Assistance Program is something that you cannot, you cannot make applications for unless you've received uh, a letter of intent for foreclosure. You're actually in the process. What they really, I, I see the state mortgage, um, the Emergency Mortgage Assistance Program kind of as a stopgap measure if we can't work and get something um, negotiated between you and the lender in terms of a modification or you can't do a refinance, you try to do all these other things and at the end of the day you're at that for this particular program and see if you can be accepted in it. And just to kind of let me know how it works, what they would do if they accepted you in the program they would look at the mortgage you're making now. They would look at like 35% of whatever your monthly income is. And they'd include whatever your utility expenses are. And they might say, okay, Bridget, according to your income, 35%, we think the comfortable amount that you should be paying on a monthly basis is $1,500. Maybe my mortgage is $2,000. So they would have me pay $1,500 to CHAPA, and then they'd make my mortgage payment of $2,000. But every month, that $500 is being put against my property as a second mortgage. So that's money that you have to eventually pay back. 